Okay, so my name is Laura Broxon and I run the National Animal Rights Association and I'm here with a very good friend of mine and activist Diane Keevans. Hey Diane, thanks for joining me today. Hi Laura, thanks for asking me. It's my first time on Zoom, so yeah, I'll probably make a mess of it. <laughs> You'll be great and I can't wait to hear all about what you have to say. So what I've been asking everyone is, uh, first of all, what made you get involved in activism? What made you go vegan? What was the start of your kind of activist journey? Right, the start was all my like from once I was no height, I always loved animals. I grew up in a farm. I was led to believe that the animals all went to go homes and they were sold and that everything was normal, the breeding that went on. And this went on until I was 11. And then I got this. Um, newsletter from Hillside Animal Rescue telling the real story about the meat trade, what really goes on and I didn't eat meat since then and um, I just felt everyone had lied to me and I began to mistrust people then and think oh I've been lied to all this time and look at well, cover-ups you know the poor animals the suffering they're going through and it's all a big cover and the people know what's wrong the farmers know what's wrong because if, if they thought it was right why would they lie about it you know and um yeah because it's very wrong and then when i was 14 then i didn't know about being a vegan like because like, i was in the country and and people didn't even know what vegetarian was and then when i found out what being a vegan was then i that was it then again. But again, with being a vegan, it's something that you think you're all fully vegan, then you find out something you're using isn't, and some company owns something that, yeah. But look, if you try your best, that's the only you can do, yeah. Mm. Yeah, I think, you know, especially when you're a new vegan and um, you're going to make mistakes and you're going to, you know, buy things from companies you don't know, but it's all a journey. And like, even you know, me and you are like many, many years vegan um, and we're still learning and stuff all the time as well. Um, but what was your uh, first protest? Do you remember what your first protest or campaign you got involved with was? Oh, um, let me think. Gosh, what would that be? God, this is difficult. Um, I was always like giving out about like the hunts and things like that and in where, where I came from. But like I was in a protest. Oh my God. There's so, there's so many you can't remember which is the first, you yeah, know. <laughs> it would probably have been um, something to do with circuses, I'd say. Probably, yeah. Yeah, something like that. I can't, like it's so long ago, I'd say it was probably something to do with circuses, but I was always against the, the horse fairs as well and things like that, you know, and I wouldn't be necessarily like holding up a banner protest, but I would go around and, you know, voice my opinions, how wrong I thought the whole thing was. Yeah. Yeah, I think um, you're kind of like the perfect example of how much you can do like as an independent activist because I've known you for many years now, Diane, and I know that like if you see something wrong going on, you just deal with it immediately. <laughs> you, don't, <laughs> you don't you don't wait for for someone else to deal with it. You don't stand back and you know spend weeks coming up with a plan to deal with it. You just take action immediately, and you've been <laughs> like that since I met you. So you know, I think you're definitely like a number one example of how much can be achieved you know just by one person just by standing up in the moment and saying no this is unacceptable and dealing with this you know? <laughs> <laughs> what what would what would your uh, advice be to anyone who's thinking of getting involved who might be maybe a little more shy or reluctant or nervous if they see something wrong you know what would your advice to them be because you just act immediately and not everyone you know feels that brave so if you if, if you had to give advice to someone who on how to act immediately what would it be okay um but there's no one around to help them they're on their own they have to do it they just have to find that that the power to, to voice their opinions because it's there inside them if they think something is wrong they have the power mm -hmm. to say it's wrong yeah and it the first time would be very scary but afterwards then um they'll think, my God, why did I ever think I couldn't do this? Yeah, I, that's what I'd say. But then again, there is some people who genuinely it would be daunting for them. So then if so, they could contact you. You'd be great for giving them advice. Yes, you'd be the best one for that. Um, I wouldn't say to contact the, the ISPCA. We'll come on to that in a minute about them. My God, no. <laughs> hmm. 
Yeah, I, I think, you know, for immediate action, the advice is definitely like contact um, an animal rights person um, or an activist in your area. I, I think uh, all animal rights activists could agree that if you were relying on the, the ISPCA, you'd be waiting a long time, definitely. Um, but that, that kind of brings me on to um, your local campaigning in Cork. You, you were a big part of uh, the campaign to ban fur farming. Can you tell me a little bit about um, what you did in Cork for that campaign? Yeah, myself and um, there was a few other fellas, Alan Bennett and Mark and Mark Cronin and um, there was there was a few of us anyway that we we um, we'd have a table every Saturday and we'd hand out leaflets and get signatures. You know, it's just like the normal, but just informing the people about it because um, and you know, listen to their opinion, not to them hadn't even considered into the fact about the animal suffering you know they 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 just kind of thought oh, it's just the done thing but when you talk to them and listen to their their sides as well you'd be surprised and um that was a good way of educating the people really on it um so now at the moment me and alan were not obviously these these last few months but we had a table then for the ban hair course and campaign which hopefully fingers crossed will come about and Yes, so that was um, the tables and the handing out the leaflets and informing people and getting petitions. Yeah, um, that was a street campaign. But at the moment now, there's there's a different kind of a campaign on the go. There's these birds that are kept in cages in this phone repair shop. And it's so small, the phone repair shop, you couldn't even swing your arm out in it. You'd knock things over. They're up on top of all these boxes in a corner of it. The shop is closed nearly all the time. They don't have access to a front sunlight coming in. There's no sunlight. There's constant music playing in the arcade all the time, like pumping music that must really annoy them. But then you can still hear them kind of saying, and then at nighttime, they turn the music down and you can hear these birds. And I thought first, oh, you know, these aren't real birds. Um, of course they wouldn't be real birds, I thought, in, in this kind of place. I thought it was a CD that they put on to calm the people down because this is like the start of lockdown. And this was out for a while. You know, I was full sure. I thought, no, because you can't really see them. They're hidden like. And then anyway. This is, this is in Cork City Centre, isn't it? This is a, yes. a, a phone repair shop. Yes, in Paul Street's arcade, yes. And then um, this girl posted up on Facebook about them that they were real and I couldn't believe it. And I went in then to investigate, saw that they were. Oh my God, I was so horrified. And we went to the guards, we contacted the ISPCA, we contacted the people that owned the property and we contacted security guards in the place, all of this and to no avail because the ISPCA said that because the birds have been fed and watered, there's nothing wrong. Of course there's something wrong it's a prison for them it's torture for them every day they're so unhappy it's 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 horrific just because they're seeing them people think that means they're happy it's not it doesn't mean they're happy that's their voice that's what they do hmm. absolutely no that's that's terrible and i think this is another example where you've you've seen something you've reacted to it and you're, you're taking action about it um, I, I remember seeing um, you sharing it on Facebook and I couldn't believe it because you can clearly make out the cage even in the photo with the shutters down you can make mm. out the cage and what's going on and um, we've been talking about it and about the lack of action from Gardaí, ISPCA and um, local authorities and all that no one seems to care and it seems to be the case that if they have food and water they can be left in the dark on their own in a cage all day and that's absolutely fine and it's just it's just not so no. you know it, it's something that like uh, everyone anyone in Cork uh, needs to, to help with this campaign to get the birds out of there um, and as soon as these COVID restrictions are over um, I'll definitely be down helping you as well oh, but really like, well, well done for taking action on that so I can't believe that it's still going on you know. Oh, it's horrific. It is. But like maybe I need to get leak to take legal action next because or else ask the to see the copy of the rent agreement, you know, for the place because I'm sure it says no pets allowed. And if it does, well then that's it, like the birds will get saved. Yeah. Yeah, I mean I think like you know, you're you're doing this um very strategically and tactically, uh looking into are they insured for this kind of thing. And I doubt they would be, even for health and safety reasons to have, you know, birds on a premises. I think there probably is an issue in there. So definitely a good idea. 
Oh, I reported them to the health and safety in the council, and they said the woman said, unfortunately, no, they rang me back, no, that um, um, it's not really a health and safety issue. I said it is though because you know what the birds droppings and that's so near the food place, there could be flies around that could poison the food. You know, like as if I care that, but you know, I have to pretend. And she was yes, well, no, this is uh, nothing to do with us, and should contact the ICPCS. Like, oh my God, I've done that. Yeah, yeah. yeah they all they all tend to kind of refer you to each other you know I find that as well if you can make a complaint they say oh it's not us it's someone else oh it's not us someone else and bounce back and forth but I think I think a few um, big protests maybe would sort that out uh, yeah. when, we, when we can all travel again <laughs> Definitely, yeah, because they, they, like I'm not giving up on this. No, because the one, if this gets stopped, I'm sure there's loads of more instances around the country that the birds can be saved. This, I wouldn't say this is a one-off. Mm. Oh, definitely, definitely. And you know, a, apart from kind of street activism and things, you've been involved in discussions leading up to the new hair coursing bill. Uh, you were part of a, a kind of a roundtable discussion with Paul Murphy, uh, TD, who's proposing the bill. So, you know, you, you're, you've had street activism, political input, um, and you're, you're very supportive of the campaign to ban blood sports. And I think at the time of the meeting, we were kind of discussing how a ban on hair coursing would be sort of a window into a ban on fox hunting, mm. shooting, lamping, all sorts of other blood sports. What do you see as the next step up from hair coursing? Where do you see the campaign going? Yes, well, um, fingers crossed hair coursing will get banned. That'll be fantastic. And then, um, like, obviously I want all cruel sports to go, but fox hunting is a definite I want gone. Yeah, and um, like the hunt stabs, they do fantastic work. You know, it's, it's very risky and everything because the law, the law is on the side of the hunt. So by going out, sabbing, sabbing is, you know, where you, where you try to, to stop, the, the, to save the fox, to get between the hounds and the fox, to save the fox with uh, this artificial scent and um, citronella spray that, that puts the um, puts the hounds off following the fox. That's what you do. It, there's n absolutely no violence involved on the sabs part, even though people label sabs as being terrorists because that's cover their face. They do that as a security measure so they can't be identified because the people who are in the hunt, they're the they're they're the bad ones. They're they're the ones to watch out for because they would go and if they knew who the person was that was sabbing, and they could damage their property, their animals, their family, they could do anything. And um, it's just horrendous, you know. And then the Sabs are classed as terrorists, but they're the ones who are saving lives without doing any harm. They do absolutely no harm, leave no damage behind. All they want to do is save the fox, that's all. They don't want to hurt the horses or hurt the hounds because Sabs respect animal life, they respect all life. But the people in the hunt don't, and that's it, yeah. Absolutely. And it, it's great to see that there are sad groups now, um, you know, all around the country setting up and taking direct action um, in the, the hunting seasons to save foxes. And, you know, I definitely recommend check them out on Facebook, check out the websites uh, and get involved because, um, you know, direct action does save lives. And it's very important, I feel, especially with blood sports campaigns, that you're coming at this from every angle whether it's street activism, info stalls, uh, political lobbying, direct action. It's about time that blood sports was banned in this country and it, it definitely needs a collective effort to do it. Yeah, and you know, like sabbing mightn't be for lots of people, just like um, getting petition signed mightn't be for others, but there's something in this, there's so many different angles to go at this, there's something for everyone. There is. Everyone can do their bit, no matter how shy or how enthusiastic they are. Or, um, there's always something people can do. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Um, you know, not everyone's comfortable with everything, and it's important to find the right kind of activism that mm. suits you and what you're comfortable with, and where your ex expertise lies, and stuff like that as well. Um, so yeah, absolutely agree with you, 100% there. Um, and in terms of, say, you know, we've, we've been having these discussions a lot um, about the need to shift from animal agriculture to plant-based vegan agriculture. Do you think this is something that we can see in Ireland in, in the future? Oh, well, I would love if that could happen. I would. Unfortunately, you know, I, I know what farmers are like and they they 
they grow up on the farms, their fathers are farmers, their grandfathers going back, going back. So they just kind of stick with the same pattern as, as, as has happened, you know, all through the generations. And they don't see how much easier it would be for them, first of all, you know, just growing the plants and stuff. How much more money they'd make from it that way. And then... Um, like everything is on their side in that, but they're they're stubborn. They just need to be to be educated and on the difference between the two that it doesn't mean that they would lose out it doesn't mean anything bad for them it's, it's just good it's all positive and that's all i'd say like honestly if there was proper discussions given to them about it they would be willing to do it yes it's just um you know the department of agriculture and chalk is going on at them um the, if if we could get them on our side and get them to talk to the farmers the farmers would listen to them they wouldn't listen to us because they see us as too radical and uh, far out you know and um, they think we don't have a clue but like if Chagas or the Department of Agriculture would do it I'd say they would listen and we would I can see it happening if they would do that because um, honestly farmers aren't stupid you know they, and they just haven't got their head in the right place when it comes to animal welfare they're not it's not that they're bad or evil some of them really do think they care for their animals but the old tradition of just sending them on then and everything else is still there but if they realize that there is another way of making money that means the animals won't have to die i would say they do it yeah 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 definitely definitely i think it just needs to be sort of presented um in the right way and i hope that over time you know we as animal rights activists and vegans can help form this template that even if um, animal you know, farmers don't want to listen to us, then if they had something that they could get from the Department of Agriculture to show how easy it would be and how profitable it would be for them to shift to plant-based vegan agriculture, I definitely think it's something that I hope we can see in our lifetime anyway. <laughs> yes. Along yeah. with banning blood sports and everything, like wouldn't it be brilliant? All these things, but they can look at the, the fur farming that worked, that campaign worked. So I think anything is possible. Yeah, absolutely. Now after after the the, the blood sports campaigns are over, and I'm I'm you know I'm I'm sure we're going to win this. I'm sure we can get uh, hair coursing banned. I'm sure we can get fox hunting banned. What do you think is the next big campaign for the country? Would it be um, animal testing? Would it be focusing on vegan campaigns? Where do you think would be the next best strategy to go with campaigning? Okay, um, the next best one would probably be, well, well, yeah, animal testing is terrific and everything it is. Um, yeah, that like that, that that that's like really really bad. Um, of course, animal testing because that applies like everyone, everything people use and stuff that they buy, loads of stuff is tested in animals, you know. Um, so that would be a big thing. And also, of course, yeah, to focus on what we were saying about the farming, the whole way of farming, that would be that would be great if we could do kind of like both of them ones. That would be brilliant. Yeah. Um. Also, I know people will kind of think right and um, but i i think you know the um people with um the, like show jumping horse race and all them things i think they're horrific i really do and the injuries the horses get from it and the way they're just discarded off and everything i i'd love to see that thin bands i think in my opinion they are a less graphic form of blood sport because there's not there's not a happy ending for the animals at the end of it. I think it's hard. I think they are rotten. Yeah. Yeah. Ab absolutely. Um. That's that's a a really good point. Actually. Um. You know, greyhound racing and horse racing mm. is a blood sport. It's just you know they're packaged in a kind of different way, and people don't see the killing themselves. You know. Mm. Um. But de they definitely are blood sports, and I think that if we were to ban hare coursing, fox hunting, I think that you know, greyhound racing would kind of tie in with that in particular, and then that would then have a knock-on effect with, with uh, horse racing. So mm -hmm. I definitely think that's a good idea. And I know that, like, you've been involved um, with some protests outside, outside greyhound racing stadiums, uh, as have I. And I, I definitely think, compared to, say, when me and you were doing this maybe 10 years ago, I see a big shift in people's attitudes about it. And I think mm -hmm. that now more than ever, there's a good chance of getting greyhound racing banned, at least. What do you think? Yes, I do definitely, and I I hope that the same, the same, 
enthusiasm for getting the band will go on to horse racing too because like that's terrific like it really is like um I know firsthand I used to help out at racing stables when I was young and um, my god these horses are so full of energy and they're confined in a little box walking round and round to get all these habits like weaving and crib biting and everything it's unnatural unhealthy horrific it's not on at all it should not be allowed that's just the, the, their living conditions. And then when they're everything else, the, the way they're trained, that stress that they're put through, it's everything about it is wrong. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So we, ha we have a, a lot of work to do, basically. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> now, I know, I know things um, at the moment are a little bit more difficult uh, with the COVID-19 pandemic and, you know, restrictions and things like that. Um, but, you know, what's your kind of plan in getting back to activism in the next couple of weeks? Like, it looks like we might be somewhat able to resume to some form of normalcy around the end of July, beginning of August. And I think that's when we're thinking of resuming our protests. Well, what's your kind of plan over the next couple of weeks? I suppose um, it, it, it'll still be with these birds for the time being. I still have, and um, um, there's, I, I, I just... I'm trying to rack my brains for a way of getting them out of there. Yeah, so that's like the big thing at the moment. And um, I have to talk to Alan about the, about us. I'm not sure if we'd be allowed to the table in the street. Will people take leaflets off us? I don't know. I think it's, um, yeah, I think the birds is like there in front of me that needs, I really, really need to focus. And like I am, but I need to even like, some magic spell or something to get them out. There has to be a way. Yeah. And um, also um, some, you know, with the, there's bound to be some training offence or that, you know, with the, with um, the saps and stuff, you know, like kind of socially distance. I don't know. Anyway, look, um, I don't think anyone would be spying on us, but there should be things like that, you know, changes. So if I could be of any help with them, and I know that the monster saps um, are taken and um, they got on to, thanks to you putting up the information about what was happening in Kilkool, then the, the foxes are going to be saved, not shot and all this. You know, there's, there's always, always something. Every day there's something. Just open your eyes and listen and look around you. You'll see something that can be done. Yeah. Yeah, ab absolutely. Um, and like as soon as as soon as we can uh, travel down uh, to help you with the, the birds in the phone shop, we definitely will. Mm -hmm. Uh, but for anyone who might want to get involved um, with your, you know, campaigning locally, whether it's protesting at the phone shop or joining your info stalls um, and stuff like that, is there any way people can get in touch with you um, to, to learn how they can help? Um, they could contact me on Facebook. Um, my name is Diane. And then in between, a capital R for animal rights and then Kevin's K W E. B A N S or else um um my yeah that would probably be the easiest way but not everyone is on Facebook so um um I don't know is it is it advisable to give my phone number out probably prob probably not probably oh, not no. but we can just maybe if anyone even wants to contact um anyone down kind of in, in Cork or the south of the country if anyone wants to join up and help out Diane um, in her campaigns and activism around Cork. Maybe even they can message through the, the NARA Facebook page mm. um, and then I can put them in touch with you then if that would work. Brilliant. Thanks, Laura. Yeah, because um, we used to have the tables on a Saturday, but now with, um, with um, the market being, the market that I'm part of, the Jones Market, it used to be open on Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Now we're only going to open Saturday and Sundays from the end of June. And for a while anyway. So it can probably be Fridays so I'll be have the table in town with Annan because then that way um I could stay longer and give it more time and um I wouldn't have to rush back to work. So yeah, I think it probably Friday would be a good day. So usually it would be probably between twelve and three. It could be longer if there's other people around to help. So people could come up to our table, it's just be on Patrick Street outside um between kind of pennies and the bus stop thing we have a table on this on the footpath now i'd say we'd be allowed to do that by the end of june do you think so laura i'd, I'd say that probably maybe maybe not by june but maybe end of july because i think mm. the the two meter distancing is still going to apply mm. but i suppose maybe you could be one end of the table and the other end of the table or yeah. something like that so 
probably I'm thinking things we can kind of get back to normal ish around end of July. So um, I think you should be okay from then. And, and we'll definitely encourage everybody to support you. But if you had one message um, to give out to anyone who say, you know, n not vegan or not yet an activist and, you know, thinking about, you know, going vegan or getting involved in a campaign, what would you say to them to encourage them and inspire them to, to get involved? Okay. Um, I think I'd say to them, just put yourself in the place of, of the animals. Imagine you're them and think what would, what would you want the human to do? And I suppose then what, what the animals would want the human to do is to respect them in every way they can to go vegan. And if you really care and respect animals, that's what you do. And it might be, seem a bit daunting and difficult at first, but once you, you do it and it's, it's, it's just the best thing you could do, it is because um, it's the only thing really if, you, if you're genuine in what you say it's, and it gives your life meaning and it's something that you're doing that, that's, that's in your heart that you just want to, to, to act on. And you can, by being a vegan, you're acting on how you feel every day of your life then. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's brilliant. Thank you so much, Diana. <laughs> um, thank, thank you so much for chatting with me today. And thanks for thanks so much for, for all you do for the for animals, not just in Cork, but all around the country. <laughs> and keep doing what you do because um, you know, you're, you're needed and you're one of you're one of my heroes anyway. So thank you for that. No and thanks, Laura. You're the best. You're the one that's everyone's hero. Yes. Not at all, not at all, not at all. Thanks, Diane. I'll see you then. Thanks, Laura. Bye. See you soon. Bye.